Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder affects hundreds of thousands of families across the UK. Well, now on BBC Radio 4, the comedian Rory Bremner presents his own take on the condition in ADHD and Me. Welcome and good evening. Hello. And who's put my script in the wrong order? <laughs> I suppose one episode that I can remember was of all things the Royal Variety Show it was about 20 years ago the one and only time I ever did it and I can remember I'd left writing it quite late you know, I think we'd written it the previous day or, or that morning in fact and I was walking around Covent Garden trying to get the script into my head not concentrating not focusing properly so by the time of the show I went on stage and the room just swam come, come back come back pretty tarry a while mate my tinsel tassel tripe. I was thinking, why now? Why are you doing it now? Look at all these people. This is the Royal Variety Show. Why are you blowing it? What are you doing, Rory? I'd like to, uh, I'd like to thank the miracle of television that made night into day, a day into Sir Robin. <laughs> Just my little joke there. And of course, while all those thoughts were going around my head, I obviously wasn't concentrating or focusing on the material. And so I sort of cut it short and, and shuffled off. And a very good evening, especially to you. you. Four years ago, a young relation of mine was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, a condition I knew little about. It was a revelation that left me both taken aback and intrigued. I started reading up on the condition, and it was then I started to think about my own life. Could my own forgetfulness and disorganisation be a result of ADHD? It's a question that's been niggling me for some time, and one that I'm eager to get answered. Harry, Harry, we made it. <laughs> nice to meet you, there. Well, great Sam. to meet you too as well. Sorry we got lost. That, I think the sat nav has been overworking a lot, but... Uh... Through this way. Thanks. I started by visiting St Catherine's Hospital in Merseyside, where Gary Sendel has set up a support group for adults affected by ADHD. First of all, can I find out how you all came together? I first came to the group in uh, the summer of 2008 with our second son, who had been diagnosed with ADHD. Robert was quite sceptical about the group afterwards and said that he didn't want to go again and asked the reason why. He said, um, because they're all like you, Mum. So I then went to our GP, who was a bit sceptical but listened and um, and then Dr Mason diag diagnosed me with ADHD. Um, I'm ADHD but I don't take medication. Um, I've got a 20 year old son who's ADHD and was diagnosed at about five, six, six, he was medicated at seven. Only child? No, or... I've got five. And he's? The, the... eldest. So he's your first? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought something was wrong with the second one who slept and sat still. I actually took him to the doctors <laughs> because I didn't know that... I thought the other one was normal, yeah. <laughs> if you know what I mean. From I my mean, first experience of a child, it's like this one sleeps all night and doesn't run around and something's wrong. He's like, seriously, bring back the other one. So, Gary, you set up this support group, but how did you first encounter ADHD? I first got diagnosed as a result of my eldest son who was diagnosed with ADHD. And that's how I ended up getting referred to the mortuary in London. But this is a long way down the track for you. Your, Ten, prob well, your, pr your problems had started very, very early, hadn't they? Well, my first recorded contact with the police was at 18 months old. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's I was, not bad going. Um, I was found wandering in the streets at 2 o'clock in the morning trying to get into cars, but I was only in a T-shirt and pair of undies. My 18 next, months old. Yeah, my next recorded incident with the police was at three years old. Um, I'd actually perfected the art of getting into cars because they found me with a load of car keys and a load of belongings to people's cars. So, for me, the onset of ADHD could have been picked up at a very early age. OK, so did you then... Were you in and out of prison or in and out of custody or what? I was... My first recorded um, criminal offence was at just past the age of 10. Um, I'd got caught stealing two pints of milk on the way to, on the way to school, um, and I got 18 months, put in care for 18 months for um, two pints of milk value, 36p. What it's was that like for you? Well, to be honest, it was normal because I was in and out of care prior to that as well. So most of my life was in and out of children's homes. For I was one of these kids when 
you got called to the headmaster's office at the end of the day, and my sisters were called with me. There would be foster parents for the for my sisters and a police officer to take me to the local kids' home because no foster parents would take me. Um, so I was considered a handful back then. Wherever I went, your files always went before you. Mm. So they read what other people have written about you. So it's a bit like that, judge your book by its cover. So you set this group up how long ago? Um, six years this year. And it's actually the one thing that I've actually stuck with, the longest thing I've ever started and seen through. In them six years, I've changed. I've become a, a new person, but the same person. Mm. I actually work as a panel member now for, for the youth offending. Um, and it, it's totally amazing. And I, I actually have coppers asking me for advice rather than asking <laughs> me to attend for bail. So it's, it's done wonders for your self-esteem yeah. as well. When I think back to my childhood, it's with a mixture of amusement and embarrassment. I seem to be always running around, forgetting things, leaving things lying around. My mum used to call me scatty and a flibbity gibbet because I could never sit still but there was never a sense that I was suffering from a condition as such. The term ADHD wasn't introduced until 1994, and almost two decades on, there's still a lot of confusion about what it actually means. Professor Eric Taylor is a psychiatrist specialising in ADHD. Well, it's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and the attention bit of it is the disorganisation, really. It's the uh, attention is in many ways a bad word. It's because very often people with ADHD can concentrate very hard when it's something they really like or really takes their imagination. Mm -hmm. they, their, their focus can be excellent. It's more problems in waiting, problems in organising things, thinking ahead, planning, all that kind of thing that you can't do quickly. And the hyperactivity side, it's acting without thinking, going into a situation before you've fully understood it, jumping in with both feet and often getting it wrong as a result, but sometimes getting it right as a result, and sometimes getting it right in an interesting and creative way. Mm. I, I sort of slightly feel like you've been watching me on CCTV for the last 49 years because, I mean, that all rings such a bell with me. But then, wouldn't it ring a bell with a lot of people? I mean, are not a lot of the conditions or a lot of the behaviours you're describing there just entirely typical of, of people in general, but children in particular? Well, I mean, you're quite right. It's a, it, it's a matter of degree. I mean, we've all got a bit of it. For one person, uh, they're going to make their ADHD work for them. They're going mm. to make their, their intuitiveness uh, uh, very effective and another person uh, with ADHD is going to go, go under and just feel that they're a total failure and, and have a miserable time and a lot of that depends upon how other people help them. It frustrates me when I can't concentrate or it frustrates me when my mind wanders uh, or I'm not able to read because I, I'm just reading the same words again and again and again. So there's a weakness in that respect but it's a strength in another respect in the sense that it, it, it's, uh, it makes it much easier for me to spot analogies to make sort of logic jumps to think in terms of comparisons and to think laterally I suppose but in a comedic sense yes. but I have absolutely no common sense whatsoever yes well very often that that means what you need is to find somebody else to do the common sense for you it's, it's, it's some, somebody else to be to be organizing and I think a lot of people do actually cope that that way just fine a spouse or a friend mm. or an agent or a secretary mm. there's somebody who will do uh, do the organising and let you get on with what you're good at. I've certainly seen people in their adult life who've really been very successful, for instance in sales, and then they get their promotion and they're promoted to an executive position and that's mm. when they go to pieces mm. because that's when it's calling for abilities that they really haven't got. I've had 40 jobs and they, they've ranged from shoplift as the store detective but my last job I worked part-time in a shop and you used to get some smelly people come in the shop mm. and I'm the one who would literally in front of him would go under the counter, get the air freshener and go whoosh, and spray the air freshener in front of him. The other people would be standing there behind them going, oh, he's just done that. <laughs> and I'd be like, but you're thinking it. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, you can't help it. I was in the chemist uh, yesterday. My wife's got a cough and I went in to get some cough medicine and the woman behind the counter said, um, is she on any other medication? And I said, no, only the methadone. And a uh, very, very straight face. <laughs> And the guy behind me burst out laughing, but the woman behind the counter, and I thought, well, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I was, it was just completely inappropriate. But I thought, very funny. Funny, yeah, no, it's it was funny. like last week, though, I got stopped by a police car in Clacton-on-Sea, and the copper said to me, 
do you know how fast you were going? I was like, no. He went, well, you were doing 45 and 40. And my answer to that was, what do you ask me for then? <laughs> oh, God. Um, Paul, Paul and I run a clinic at HMP Liverpool every Thursday afternoon, specifically for ADHD. That would be the prison, yeah. That's the prison, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and what one of the things that we're, we're picking up there um, is a number of people who've led lives similar to Gary, whose ADHD hasn't been picked up. Their impulsivity has got them it, has got them into trouble rather than got them laughs. Um, and the, a couple of couple of things really. What one is. If they'd been treated, maybe they wouldn't have committed the crime. Those that have committed the crime have done so in an impulsive way and didn't spot the CCTV cameras. And then more unfortunately, people with ADHD tend to make false confessions a lot more than most, in the sense that they just cannot stand being boxed up in the interview room, um, being interviewed, they want out, and they, if pleading guilty gets you out quicker, they'll do that, even though they end up in prison. What strikes me listening to Gary and the others in the group is just how overwhelming an impact this condition can have on the lives of adults. It affects their home lives, their ability to hold down a job, and it really can get them into serious trouble. For adults, it's not so much the hyperactivity that you associate with children with ADHD as an inability to focus and organise yourself, losing things, not being able to follow the thread of a conversation. Like Gary, it was only when a relation of mine was diagnosed with ADHD that I started to question my own behaviour. So is it hereditary? Professor Eric Taylor. Well, we know that there are strong genetic influences. Uh, it's not one gene, it's not that there's one gene that causes ADHD, it's not like that. But we know that there are quite a number of genes, which each one of small effect, but they contribute to different bits of the ADHD spectrum. So we reckon that around about 80% of the difference in people in how hyperactive they are, comes from uh, the way the genes work. Oops. <laughs> uh, 80% isn't I think 100%. My children are better look out. <laughs> well, 80% isn't 100%. Um, and it's getting there. <laughs> it's, it's a strong influence. And, the, and of course, the genes work through the environment. So it's wrong to think, you know, is it nature or is it nurture? It's always nature and nurture working mm. uh, together. So do you recognise in me symptoms of ADHD? I do, I do. Oh, I, uh, no. uh, no, I recognise the, uh, the switching from one thing to another very quickly. Uh, and I recognise you're occasionally losing the thread of your thoughts uh, mm. and, and pausing and retracting. What happens? The, uh, <laughs> you see my eyeballs going on. <laughs> no, 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 just, just in your speech and when you, and when you stop. And, the, and yes, occasionally you're looking away from the, uh, the whole thing and another thought has clearly come into your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, have I got enough milk in the fridge? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing cartwheels here because I quite like the fact that, that I'm a bit scatty sometimes and I, I, I quite like being me, but there are times when I absolutely hate being me. But what's interesting is that I, when I started out doing this, it was because I knew from experience of other members of my family the kind of effects that ADHD can have. And I felt that there must be thousands of families who really struggle when they have close relatives or people in their extended family who have these disorders. And the rest of the world will say, oh, it's just bad behaviour, it's just bad parenting or whatever, and it isn't. It's taken me five decades to get recognition that I may have a medical condition, but are things changing for the next generation? How far have we come in spotting and treating young people with ADHD? And are kids getting the support they need to help prevent them having the same sort of problems that Gary and I had when we were growing up? Hi, hello. Hi. How are you? Lovely to meet you, Avril. Yes, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I've come to West Lothian to meet eight-year-old Rhys Sinclair and his mother, Avril. Oh, here's Rhys. How was your day? What, Dylan? A bit thing. A bit oh, thing. Sorry. Good? A Thumbs up? A bit trouble. A bit trouble. Um, <laughs> one was a gym. Um, I wouldn't join in, but I did join in eventually, but she, I got better, so she just so you turned it around forget about it. it. Good. Yeah, so she just Excellent. said forget about it. So, so oh, good that's day. Good. So, Reese, can we have a chat about your day later on? Let me get how... back to the house. Good idea. <laughs> that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea. 
Avril, today's one of the good days? It is one of the good days, yeah. But it sounds like it wasn't always like that. What t- Take us through it from the beginning. That would be a way back to when he was in playgroup. <laughs> was that when you first yeah, sort of thought, first hang saw on, it. we've got our hands full here? Yeah, three and a half, I would say. And then he went to primary, and it was from primary that... <sighs> hellish. Yeah. It was tapping pencils on the table or he used to walk backwards in the class and it was all like class clown stuff. I would get maybe three phone calls a week and we'd stand in the playground waiting for him coming out and it'd be, Mrs Sinclair, over, can I see you for a minute? And I used to dread going down to pick him up from school because it was always me that was called over. Uh-huh. Um, and did the, the, they talk, the, the, the schools and the, the, the playgroup, did they, did they say, listen, you've got to learn to control him, this is yeah. down to you, this is your parenting? Very much so. The teacher at the time used to say, if I was you, Mrs Sinclair, and Reese was my child, I would take him straight home, close off, no dinner, straight to bed. And so this is what i done, because I was at my wit's end, and so being a first-time mum, impressionable, I used to live take everything on board and do what she said. So you'd be back home, sent to bed without any supper? Without supper, yeah. And he used to cry and cry and cry, I'm sorry mum, sorry mum. And I used to say, well, you can't do this, Reese. This is not acceptable behaviour. So now you're doing what might conventionally, OK, it's harsh, yes. but it's conventional discipline. Oh, yes, very um, instant sanction. And did it work? No, no, it didn't work. It didn't work at all. You also um, had to, I mean, not just a disruptive child, but a very unhappy child as very well. Very unhappy. The penny didn't drop. He thought, oh, if I behave well, that won't happen. Yeah. It didn't, no. it wasn't that you straightforward? Just couldn't, no. Couldn't at all. Well, what was your lowest ebb, your worst point? My worst point was when I realised that um, Reese was losing his hair and he actually had alopecia when he was five. So how did you find and that? I just noticed at the back of his head he had this ball patch, probably about the size of a 50 pence piece. And I took him to the doctor and the doctor said it was alopecia through stress. And I said, my wee boy's five. I said, he should not be stressed. And that's when we started looking at it more seriously. And initially when I went to the doctors and I said, I think my son's got ADHD, we sat there quite the thing, polite, and he wasn't fidgeting or anything. And the doctor says, I can tell you now he's not got ADHD. She said, he's never moved. He sat there and I said, you've only seen him in a five-minute slot. Mm. <laughs> How can you say that? So I pushed it again and I said, no, I want him assessed. I did that all by myself. Eh? Mm. I did it all by myself. What's in that picture? It was his mother's determination that finally led to Reese's diagnosis. So why hadn't his school picked up on it? Bill Colley is a former head teacher who now advises schools on ADHD. I asked him, are schools doing enough? to both identify and support kids like Reese. The obvious answer is no, but I think it would be easy to criticise schools. I, I think ADHD, as you'll have discovered from your own exploration of the subject, is extraordinarily complex, and I don't think there's an off-the-peg solution. But I think the key thing is for teachers and anyone working with uh, young people who have ADHD is to appreciate just where they're struggling. And if they don't look beneath the behaviour, then they're not going to see the, the chronic... Um, chronically corrosive effect of ADHD on social interaction and on self-esteem. And how can you overcome that? One is to raise general awareness amongst teachers um, of, of the existence of ADHD. And remember, in this country, we probably identify about a fifth of the children who have attention disorders. Um, teachers, yes, we need to do a lot more. There are issues to do with resources. There are issues to do with accommodation. I think we've got a long way to travel yet. So you've got your, is this a boat? Submarine? Reese was just six when he was first diagnosed with ADHD, and after three years of torment, the Sinclairs were able to adopt an approach that was right for their son. First thing definitely is routine. Have a routine. Um, tell your child as well what's happening, because um, sometimes if I go in the car and we head off to the shops and then I change my mind and go somewhere else, he gets really confused about that and he gets really distressed because in his head I'm going to the shops, I'm not going anywhere else. Um, get down to his level all the time, try and get the eye contact and always say, do you understand? Do you understand? So you're taking it step by step. So we prompt him with everything. I learned myself to try and less the shouting. Um, and to see him as being maybe three, four years younger than what he actually is. So it was 
it was beneficial for us to understand how Reese actually mind works. Mm-hmm. So do you think those on their own and a sustained routine of those techniques uh, would would turn Reese around? It can do, but every day is different. <laughs> every day is different. Reese, yeah. you need to take your medication. Okay. We tried things at home, and the doctor was saying to us, you know, he has got significant ADHD that she recommends that we went on to medication. But as a parent, you don't want to do that, do you? No, definitely not. Um, I was very much, mm, I really don't want to go down that road because of all the bad press. And I was like, but, you know, Reese isn't quite that bad. (laughs) I was in denial, wasn't I? He hasn't got that bad. We'll work with, um, have you not got, like, behavioural therapy? So we put a lot of things in place first. But then when we came home and we discussed everything over a couple of weeks, it was, wasn't it? Mm. We thought, you know, it's what's best for Reese. And if he's not able to focus at school and he was so distraught, you've just got to think what's best for your child. So we opted to try it. And what, what was the difference? Um, <laughs> simple things, sitting and eating a meal at home, because he could never do that. He could never sit at the table. Mm-hmm. He was always fidgeting or getting up or running around. So schoolwork, big improvement. Mm-hmm. He was able to focus more. Even the homework, because the homework used to be a, a constant battle. As any parent can imagine, the decision to put their son on medication must have been one of the hardest that Avril and Chris ever had to take. Drugs like Ritalin frequently hit the headlines, and often for the wrong reasons. But what are we letting our children in for when we put them on medication? Dr David Coggle is a lecturer in child and adolescent psychiatry and runs an ADHD clinic that each year sees hundreds of children just like Reese. We've done some uh, specific studies in looking at how does Ritalin affect the way that you think? How does it affect the thought processes? And one of the most interesting um, things that we found amongst a whole range of difficulties, thinking type deficits that um, that, that, um, children with ADHD have, is that children with ADHD have quite severe memory problems. And actually they're very forgetful, as forgetful in some of our tests as some of the um, patients with Alzheimer's. And that's a really striking um, finding that we, that, that, that we had there. Now we then treated those children who had never had medication for their ADHD with Ritalin. And what we found was that those memory deficits actually were greatly improved by giving the medications. And also some other aspects of the way in which our brain thinks, the way in which it deals with information have been demonstrated both by us and by others to be very much improved by medication. I can hear listeners, you know, throughout the country now sucking their breath in going, oh, medication. Uh, It has become such a controversial subject, hasn't it? It has, and, and it's interesting because even though we now have a lot more information, a lot more data to both to show the the, the very positive nature of um, treating children, young people, adults with medication, and a lot more information to help us to understand that these are actually very safe medicines, that they don't cause harm to most people who take them. There certainly are some people for whom any particular medication isn't right. Just as ADHD isn't only for children, neither are the treatments. Take Gary Sendel, who I met earlier in the programme. Methylphenidate, or Ritalin as it's more commonly known, has helped him achieve a level of stability that he'd never thought possible. But it has come at a cost. When I got my diagnosis, which took about four years in total, um, it was a long process. I was then given medication, and for, for the first time at the age of 36, I started to feel things that I'd never felt before, to the point where they were actually quite overwhelming. I'd know what it was like to be angry, but I'd never known what it was like to feel angry. And then to start at the age of 34, 35, 36, to start feeling things that I'd never felt before was overwhelming for me. What did it get like at the worst moments? Um, Seven slashes on the wrist. That's what it took, because 
I didn't know what what it was I was feeling and how to deal with it because no one had told me what to expect. <laughs> to be get taken from chaos into calm and just told, oh, put up with that. It's strange, it's scary, and it's unusual. So you'd rather have what you're used to, which is chaotic. There's a Gary sat here in front of you right now wearing a shirt and a pair of trousers. And the other Gary wears trackies and trainees and T-shirts and his bear goes and doesn't care what he says, doesn't care who he hurt, and he doesn't care who he walks all over. And I miss that Gary. But when that Gary comes back, because I actually don't take my medication over the weekend, um, and he shows his face, and he's inconsiderate, he's faultless, and doesn't give two monkeys, but misses this Gary. I like having two Garys. And I, do, and I have a little taste of them every weekend. And so does everybody else. And everybody else is praying for the other one to come back. <laughs> Sadly, the vast majority of adult ADHD sufferers remain undiagnosed, and many rely on a different form of medication to live normal lives. Here's ADHD advisor Bill Colley again. Probably the, the, the most common coping strategies, but not ones I would recommend, involve the, the two most commonly used drugs to, to medicate or self-medicate ADHD, which are nicotine and alcohol. And I think both of those are used by the general population uh, who have ADHD to, particularly adults and, and undiagnosed adults, to manage their mood and temperament, um, to ensure that the brain isn't whirling around all the time uh, in, in order to watch a television programme or listen to music or even just to engage in conversation and focus on, on somebody. Then having a cigarette or having um, a glass of wine uh, um, appears socially acceptable, uh, but it's actually a form of self-medication. Making this programme has helped me understand my own ADHD tendencies better. But more importantly than that, it's made me aware of the thousands of families affected by the condition who are living lives of the most extraordinary frustration, battling with depression, family breakdown and low self-esteem. I believe their lives could be transformed if society's attitude towards this disorder changed. There is help and support out there, and it's not just drugs. There are lots of strategies that can help both children and adults with ADHD. My own include, for example, constantly making lists, setting my watch five minutes fast, and planning and timetabling my day to the last detail. As for Gary, well, he has his own methods. Above my computer, I've got a post-it note that says, what are you meant to be doing? <laughs> because if I'm, if I'm locking up at the ceiling, then I'm not constant, I'm not focused. So it's just little things like that.